طلعي بس على على الكاميرا ايش اسمك ام وحيد فهميه انا يعني اسمي ام وحيد لما طلع على الكاميرا لازم تطلع على الكاميرا قد ايش عمرك عمري 90 مين جوزك جوز عبد الحليم الله يرحمه شو كان يشتغل فخار وولاده كم فخار. واحد فخار سبع اولاد فخار هم اولادهم تمام You don't choose to be a potter in Hebron. Since time out of mind, this calling has been passed down from father to son. Many have abandoned the craft over the last few decades, although the products have diversified and orders are on the increase. Seven families were still potters in the early 1970s. Since then, the number has fallen to four. Due to local taxation and transportation problems between the Palestinian territories and Israel, the profession is becoming less and less viable. The younger generation dreams of better wages. remaining potters still use century-old techniques, as pottery made under Ottoman rule in the 16th century testifies. Family organization has done much to transmit ancestral skills over time. Through being kept inside extended families, which include fathers and married or unmarried sons, the craft has escaped the turmoil of the last two centuries with this history full of war and violence. In 2019, the four Potter families of Hebron amounted to about 50 people, including the young and not so young. They all have the same surname, al Fakhri, which means Potter. أنا عبد السلام الفاخوري من الخليل أعمل في صناعة الفخار تقريبا من 30 عام من مدينة الخليل اسمي أحمد الفاخوري عمري 27 سنة من مدينة الخليل أعمل في صناعة الفخار منذ 17 عام أنا حماد الفاخوري بشتغل في مصنع فخار إلي 25 سنة عمري 36 سنة و25 سنة إلي بشتغل فيها وتعلمت من أنا عمري 10 سنين عن أبي وجدي اسمي هشام الفاخوري عمري 49 سنة وإلي 44 سنة بشتغل في هالشغلة اسمي حسين الفاخوري عمري 58 سنة إلي 35 سنة في الشغلة هذه اسمي محي الفاخوري عمري 25 سنة إلي 15 سنة بشتغل في هالشغلة والحمد لله رب العالمين أنا شاكر نعيم الفاخوري عمري 47 سنة صار لي 30 سنة بشتغل في شغلة الفخور أنا اسمي عنان الفاخوري طبعا من الخليل وإلى حوالي هون يمكن 20 سنة بنشتغل في المصنع هذا في مصنع الفخار اسمي محمد صلاح الفاخوري وعمري 25 وإلي بشتغل بالفخار حوالي 10 سنين اسمي حلم الفاخوري صار لي 10 سنين بشتغل مع أبي بالمحل هذا أنا شكري الفاخوري I'm 47 years old I uh, work in this job, uh, pottery making, uh, since about 20 years ago. The families are settled on neighboring plots of land, only a few hundred meters apart, purchased in the 1960s in Alfaz, an industrial area two kilometers south of Old Hebron. Old Hebron is the location of the tomb of the patriarchs and also used to be that of the home of the family of potters, the Hosh. The living quarters on the first floor and the workshops on the ground floor were built around the central courtyard.
The potters could not stay in the centre of Hebron because, to fire the kilns, they replaced their traditional fuel, consisting of wood and olive stones, with old tyres. The kilns were next to the houses. The smoke was black, thick and terribly polluting. Accordingly, in agreement with the municipality, the potters agreed to move to the south of the city, to a then uninhabited area, where land was cheap and where vegetables and fruits were grown that were well known and appreciated throughout the region. Since then, the environment has changed. An industrial zone has developed and the air has become thick with white dust from the stone factories. The potters of Hebron now work in a polluted and noisy environment, and they are all exclusively men. The women and children, who used to live in the rooms above the workshops, have gone back to the city, scattered in different neighbourhoods. In this working environment, each family's parcels of land include several workshops, created as the sons got married and became responsible for their own production. Each workshop carries through the whole manufacturing process from start to finish, and it is within each workshop that from a very young age the potter's craft is learned. For from his earliest years, every boy is exposed to the various activities in the workshop, where they pass their time after school and in the holidays. They help in handling the pots, whether in drying or loading and unloading the kilns. They also help prepare the clay. They can even practice throwing on the wheels their parents are not using. Some decide to quit school at the age of 13 to 14 to work full time. The previous generation started the craft at the age of 8 to 10. Now 72, Wahed started throwing pots at 11. His younger brothers had the job of bringing him the lumps of clay. He already knew how to throw vessels of all shapes and sizes when he was only 17. From the age of 15, he was in charge of firings. Wahed says, a good potter is one who prepares the clay well and who can throw any shape or size while keeping the right proportions. Preparing the clay is by far the longest stage in the process. It takes place between April and October, the warmest months when the clay can dry quickly. Preparing the clay well means balancing the proportions between the yellow and red clay, the two clays extracted in the region and whose properties are complementary. Sand is also added for the clay paste to withstand the high firing temperatures. The clay isn't sieved at all. The two types of clay and the sand are first mixed with water in electric mixers for about an hour. The aim is to liquefy the clays and separate the largest inclusions that will be removed by hand once the mixer is emptied. The time when all this used to be done with the feet is not so long ago. The mixing tanks are still there to remind us. They are next to the soaking tank. They are now used as reservoirs into which the overflow from the soaking tank is poured. This water is then pumped back into the electric mixer. It takes more than 10 mixers to fill a soaking tank whose dimensions vary from one family to another. A pipe connects these two installations. When the mixer outlet is opened, the clay liquid flows into the pipe and spreads into the soaking tank, 
after passing through the mesh of an island sea. The clay liquid rests in the tank for several days. The time needed for the hydration of the clay particles, both coarse and fine. The water at the top is pumped out as the tank fills up. The soaking tank has a sloping bottom. This lets the clay flow into the drying tank just below. The latter is sprinkled with a thin layer of sand to prevent the clay from sticking to the bottom. During the hydration process, the heaviest particles settle on the bottom of the soaking tank Before being poured into the drying tank, the clay liquid is vigorously homogenized. The clay liquid spreads until it is about 30 centimeters thick. It takes several days for the clay to become solid and be carried to the workshop in blocks. Before being used, the clay is needed to eliminate voids and distribute the coarse inclusions evenly. Sand may be added during the kneading. The sand is mixed with salt to give the pots a white colour during the firing. Nowadays, the kneading is entirely mechanised and carried out with a pug mill. The clay is extruded in the form of a cylinder the potter cuts off about every 80 centimetre. Each cylinder is kneaded several times. Every day, the potters spend a few hours doing the kneading. The most difficult task to master, the one that really puts the potter's skill to the test, 
is without doubt actually thrown in the pots. The method is unique and also practiced in Egypt, but nowhere else to our knowledge. It consists in throwing the vessels in several times in order to make the walls thin from the base to the mouth, without the need to thin them out later, as is common practice. The general principle is to avoid the risk of collapsing. This risk determines the method, which the potters themselves call roughing out by the base or roughing out by the opening. When a vessel is at its widest near its base, which is the case for the cooking pots called fokara, then the upper part weighs dangerously on the lower part, which may collapse during throwing. To avoid this risk, the potters start with the opening and the upper part of the vessel. The base is kept very thick. It constitutes a clay supply. Once the upper part of the container has been thrown, it is removed from the wheel and left to dry. Next, the vessel is placed back on the wheel, upside down. The upper part has hardened, but the base is still malleable enough to be thrown. The potter perforates the base, which is several centimeters thick. He then gradually thins the walls until he has an enlarged lower part and a rounded formed base. The principle of avoiding collapse explains why, for the large jars, called jara, the shaping is finished by the bottom.
This need to avoid collapsing also explains why for the flower pots, which are similar in shape to the Fokara, the potters throw their flat bases last. If the vessel is at its widest in the middle or near the top, the potters start with the lower part and the base. Once this first roughing out is dry, the vessel is put back on the wheel in a chunk that holds the base. The potter perforates the mass, left as a supply of clay, thins the walls of the upper part and shapes the mouth.
This principle of avoiding collapses makes potters throw any part of a vessel likely to prove too heavy separately. The throwing methods used in Hebron require working with paste stiff from the drying of the first rough out. <coughs> they also mean estimating the diameters of the parts to be assembled by the naked eye without any measuring instruments. Mastery of these methods is proof of exceptional sensory motor skills. Roughing out by the base is valid for small pieces, such as jugs, for which the shape is known to date back to the 16th century. Once the base is dry, the jug is repositioned on the wheel in a chunk. The neck is shaped from the clay supply, then detached and set aside. It will then be placed back on the body of the jug after its walls have been thinned and shaped.
Once thrown, the vessels are left to dry for several days, at first progressively inside the workshop and then outside in the sun. When dry, they are stored indoors, waiting to be fired. The firings are carried out in vertical updraft kilns. Where the pots are stacked is topped by a dome, typical of the Arab Muslim architecture, very common during the Ottoman period. The dome has an opening at the top to let the smoke out. The firing chamber, which contains the fire, is dug out from the ground. It is oblong, horseshoe shaped and vaulted. There are holes in the top of the vault which forms the floor of the heating chamber to let the flames and heat in. The vessels are stacked between this perforated floor, formed by this convex vault and the walls of the heating chamber. The kiln is loaded and unloaded through a side door, which is closed during firing. The fire is gradually fueled with used tires. For the first two hours, when the temperature is still low, the top aperture in the dome is kept closed with corrugated sheets. Then, when the fire is fiercer, the aperture is open to create a draught. When the flames come out of the aperture and the pots turn bright red, it is the sign that the maximum temperature has been reached. At this point, the kiln stops being fed with fuel. The opening in the dome is closed. The firing chamber is closed too, with the help of a metal drum. The kiln is then left untouched all night long. The side door is open in the morning to cool the heating chamber down. The unloading begins the following day. produce utilitarian and decorative pots. The demand for utilitarian pots is decreasing sharply and concerns only a few types. It is limited to water jugs and water jars, known for keeping water cool, and to the cooking pots, the fokara, still used for stewed traditional dishes. The oldest potters remember manufacturing up to 12 types of vessels in their youth, intended to store or serve various solid and liquid products. Today, the decorative pots are essentially flower pots sold to nurseries throughout the Palestinian territories and Israel. make the craft less and less viable, even though the orders keep increasing.
The younger generation is also more individualist and aspires to live outside the family circle. Pottery could nonetheless remain a craft with a future, both because of its functional qualities that kept it attractive and because of its place in Hebron's cultural heritage. is a material it was in the past uh, very essential in the society you know all uh, the people use the pottery in their homes uh, but uh, after the electricity and after the development uh, the pottery became uh, something yani, it's not important like in the past uh, but it's still working but not, not like the, in the past the pottery is a very ancient uh, manufacture I told you it's, it's an art. If, if the person doesn't love how to make pottery, he will not learn it. Look, you can say it's a difficult job, and it's difficult to learn how to make the pottery. Uh, you know the pottery is art more than skills. Uh, it's skills too, but it's art more than. So uh, this uh, job, is uh, limited in uh, our family, Al Fakhuri, and it takes uh, our family in its name takes the name of the pottery. The pottery is very benefit for the for the for human being, especially if you put the water in the pottery, it will be alive water and fresh water, uh, and uh, it's clean the water. The the body of the pottery has uh, little holes. Perhaps if anything in the water, it comes in these holes. Uh, so it's benefit, but not all the people know these things. But in these days, I think in the, when the social media spread and they speak about this, uh, I feel that the people began to turn back to the battery, especially to use it in the water. They feel that uh, they, they see an artist making a piece, beautiful piece. Like this, I, I feel I, I, see, I, see, I saw these things in their eyes when they are looking uh, for me when I'm making a, a beautiful piece. They say, "Oh my God, it's very beautiful." Yes, yes, I'm proud because it's my grandfather and grand grand grandfather work with this job. I'm proud with it.